So boosting in your passive magic and weaseling into new passive magic is a really important part of Dominions. I'm going to try to keep this video short and sweet and get as much information crammed in here as possible. I'll be going through items that you can forge, independence that you can find, and summons. I've tried to get all of the summons from each different path of magic, each into one page. So if you ever need to reference it, it's just here. You can pause at that point in the video and you'll see everything in say fire or earth or nature. But mostly I just wanna give you a quick grasp on the way to get into new paths of magic or to boost the ones that you already have. Now the easiest way to do this by far is to do it on your pretender. Let's say you wanna cast Mother Oak. You can now cast Mother Oak. Let's say you want to build elemental staves. You can now build elemental staves. And I know you might be thinking, well, duh. But it's just important to remember that there's nothing easier if you really want to get into a certain level of magic than simply doing it on your pretender. That is by far the easiest way to get it done. And now really quickly, I'm going to go over some of the boosters. These are items that you can forge using construction that when a mage equips these, it will increase passive magic that they already have. So say you give the flame helmet to a fire two mage, it will become a fire three mage. Now, if you give the flame helmet to a death Death to mage that doesn't have any fire, it's going to do nothing. So these only work if the mage already has that path of magic. Now something else that's also important to remember is multiples of the same items do not stack. If you give a mage two crystal coins, they're only going to get one effect from it. So you give an astral two mage a crystal coin, they will become astral three. If you give them two crystal coins, they will still only become astral three. If you give someone two thistle maces, them dual wield these, they're only going to get one extra point in nature. These items in red boxes you have to be level 8 to construct these and they are unique. That means there can only be one in the game. And I've kind of separated them from the other boosters because in most games, you're not going to get to Construction 8. In a game that goes on long enough to reach research paths like this, Construction usually is not going to be the first one that you get, but they might still come up. There are also a couple of boosters that are nation specific. This is the Jade Mask, only Katis can forge this, and the Crown of the Shah, only L.A. Raga can forge this. But the rest of these are open to you so long as you can get the paths to forge them. Some schools of magic it is fairly easy to boost up into. Water is an example of this. And I would also say that Water Bracelet is definitely one of the best boosters in the game because it only costs five gems. You can just spam these out and make your water mages more powerful in combat. Some paths are pretty hard to boost up into. Air is a really good example of that. There's not a lot of air boosters and the ones that you can make have pretty high magic requirements to be able to forge them. Even stuff like Staves of Elemental Master requires some pretty high levels in cross paths and you need astral 7 and 80 astral pearls to think about making a ring of wizardry. Some of these boosters have uses outside of just being magic boosters. For example, someone holding a bag of winds at the beginning of every battle, an air elemental is going to pop out. And bloodthorn is used in some thug and super competent builds because it comes with limited drain life. And down here there are a few unusual items. Uh, the crystal shield is not going to boost your pass outside of combat, only inside. So if you take a fire two mage, hand him a crystal shield, outside of combat he's still going to be a fire two mage. Put him into a fight and then he'll be fire three during the fight. And it's kind of similar with the first anvil and the first crown, which are unique artifact items. The first anvil will boost a mage's paths just for forging magic items. So say you, you give this to an air three mage, you will then be able to make a winged helmet even though it requires level four. And the first crown is the same except for magic rituals. Also, if you ever need more arm slots for stacking up multiple things, you know, say you're doing death and you want to hold like a skull staff and a scepter of dark regency, uh, you can use copper arms and you can actually stack up more than one copper arm to get more weapon slots. But yeah, I'm pretty sure this is everything as far as forging goes. Uh, anywhere in this video, if I'm missing something important, let me know in the comments. Cause I mean, this is, you know, this is a kind of a big topic Topic to chew on and I try to get everything together as best as I could but I'm sure I missed something somewhere I'd be surprised if I didn't I want to spend some time talking about independent mages because this is a very common way that people break into new paths of magic I think that I've collected everything that you will generally run into it's kind of difficult 
to organize everything possible within these. Like, for example, I was just about to start recording this, and I realized I didn't have the Lizard Shaman here, which is just ridiculous, because it's one of the best and f most common independent mages that you run into. And there's also a lot of independent mages that you get through sites. A couple of really common examples of this are the Woodhenge Druid and the Amber Clan Mage. Uh, the Amber Clan Mage could potentially be really good. The problem with it is that usually, if you're getting this, you're already, you already have water too, because you're either, you know, a water nation or an amphibious nation, something like that. But, you know, this is conceivable. Say you're an undead nation that doesn't really have much water access. This would be nice. Or maybe you're using air magic to get stuff underwater and then boom. Uh, the Sage is something that you run into sometimes, and that's an Astral One Mage. It's fairly cheap and that one is site specific but i'll mostly talk about the ones that are tied to the independent type that you find and not sites by far the most common path you'll run into is nature uh, nature tends to be all over the tribes it comes with the lizards and woodhenge druids really aren't that rare so generally finding nature one mages it's a little risky to say that you can rely on finding nature one mages but i will say you will almost almost certainly find at least one nature mage as long as your expansion isn't completely abysmal the main difference between these typical tribe mages are the jaguar and the lion tribe they have a lot more randoms than the wolf bear and deer tribe now this can be a good thing and this can be a bad thing like say you don't have a lot of magic diversity in your nation you might find yourself rolling for some of these unfortunately these tribe priests tend to be abysmal researchers but i mean if, if you've got some magic scales and you don't mind rolling for extra magic paths that's something that you might consider i've definitely rolled for the death on wolf tribe before and you know and that's actually something to consider is like if you're if you're looking for death and your options are lion tribe and wolf tribe it is a lot better to roll on wolf tribe than lion tribe because you have a much better chance of getting that death random wolf tribe is actually you know somewhat reliable on at least eventually getting that death random. Uh, Lion Tribe, not at all. But in general, you're not even really looking at these so much for the randoms, just for the fact that they are nature mages. If you don't have nature, this is a good place to start. The best independent mages tend to be sorceresses, uh, sinusophilian shamans, and lizard shamans. These are like kind of the, the kings of independent mages, or queens, I suppose. Crystal Sorceresses are really awesome. They turn any nation into an Astral Nation and a Thunderstrike Nation. Even if you already have these paths on your nation, uh, they just tend to be really efficient mages. Like this is this is a really nice path combination for not that much gold. Uh, this isn't the actual gold price for them. I'm actually not sure how this is calculated. Man, I don't remember exactly what these cost in game. But these things are really cool, and since you tend to spam them, you often will hit this 10% random, and this 10% random can forge Starshine skull caps. So this is a somewhat reliable way into Astral 3. And at least when it comes to combat, because the air is tied to a communion, uh, the amount of communion slaves you have is the limit for how powerful of air spells that you can cast. Uh, Garnet Sorceresses are something that I absolutely adore getting a hold of when I'm not a Blood Nation. Especially if you can get a hold of these early on, it basically turns whatever nation you're playing into an effective Blood Nation. Especially in the Middle Ages, where there's not as many really strong Blood Nations, you can definitely stand out getting a hold of Garnet Sorceresses early on. Similar to the Crystal Sorceresses, their random is 10 percent blood which is nice uh, blood is a really easy thing to boost once you have it the, the difficulty is getting blood but once you have it blood slaves are a lot easier to get a hold of than gems so it's not as hard to just straight up empower your mage in blood and get them stronger that way uh, jade sorceresses are really nice if you don't have these paths or this path combination this path combination can achieve a few different things of extremely important note these are not 10 percent random these are 25 percent random so you are going to get these if you're spamming jade sorceresses so they are a reliable way to get death and earth as well as these paths and this path combination. Uh, what is kind of nice about this path combination, just for example, is with the water two randoms, you can easily forge a water bracelet, then get up to water three, then you can summon Nyad and you're at nature three. Similarly with a nature random, you can forge a thistle mace and then this will be boosted 
nature three and you can use that to you know do foul vapors or summon things like trolls which can potentially be death two which means they can forge a skull staff and become death three so this is actually a really nice mage for breaking into various paths uh, onyx sorceress is probably the least remarkable out of the sorceresses but i mean if you're looking for that death it, you're not going to complain and especially because if you're spamming these you will eventually get a death two which means you now have death three because of skull staffs uh which also by the way breaks you into specters and of course eventually death four by summoning a mound king and having him hold a skull staff uh, cynocephalian shamans are pretty interesting half of them are going to have two paths in magic you can get all three of these into communions potentially uh, you can get nature twos out of these, which means nature three because of thistle maces. And a few of them do happen to be death, though at this low level, the cross paths with death aren't too interesting unless you're doing some really expensive empowerment stuff. I would say the big possibilities for the shaman are getting these paths onto an astral mage or getting the N2. And the Lizard Shaman is beloved by many. This is an excellent independent mage because they're not too expensive. All of them can enter communions. All of them will put nature into communions, which is a very good path for supporting communions as well as you know buffing your own units. And they're sacred, so they will hold your bless, which can be really nice if you happen to have a mage-oriented bless. So these are super powerful, and they will turn your nation into a communion nation, even if it's not one. Uh, bone readers aren't too shabby. You run into these with bone tribe. They are just very reliable death, and also 100% of them are going to get a second path, though the cross path isn't enormously remarkable. I mean, there's a couple things you could do with the death air cross path this low. Corpse constructs come to mind immediately but only so many nations can make efficient use of corpse constructs still if you're looking for any of these paths uh, this one will have it and these aren't quite as easy to find on independence now uh, this one is actually not enormously common i'm just including it because it's really cool i really love running into this one not only because you know this is just a, a flying death mage that's difficult to complain about though it's a little spread in its randoms but the province that you get these off of allows you to recruit actually fairly decent Kalian infantry and I'm a big Kalim fan so being able to splash whatever nation that I'm playing in with somewhat Kalian armies feels really good to me they're you know pretty good raiding armies Camazots these are something that you will occasionally run into in caves it's just another example of a flying death mage uh, this one unfortunately has abysmal research so it's not as nice to spam if you are, you know, really trying to roll the dice on some shaky random. But it does have that potential blood random at like, what, like 3.3%. That's not something that, you know, I'd say you should go for. It's more of just something, it's like, yeah, it's there, technically. And Ictiad shamans aren't enormously rare. So they are a somewhat common way to get, you know, at least a path in water. Their random is nature. So if you see Ictiads on the map, uh, they don't always have the Ictiad shamans but they're not too uncommon, so definitely prioritize Ichthyids in your expansion if you are really interested in getting this water. And on, you know, Ichthyids aren't that bad to prioritize an expansion anyway, because they can break you into pawns, which, you know, might be some extra income, might be something that you need to do anyway, say if you are Jomon. So there are a decent number of combat spells that will temporarily increase a mage's power in magic for the duration of that battle. Now, each one of these is fairly unique in some way, so I'm going to discuss them a little bit. Phoenix Power is fairly straightforward. You just need to have a mage that is Fire 2, and then they will become a Fire 3 mage, or likewise, a Fire 3 mage would become a Fire 4 mage, just for the duration of the battle. Phoenix Power has the added bonus of some fire resistance. Storm Power can be used by any air mage, and will make them one level more powerful in air, but it can only be used during a storm. So you have to factor in the order in which your mages are casting spells and the casting time of storm, and make sure that your mages are casting storm power after storm has been cast. A very definitive thing you'll see from powerful air nations are air two mages, casting this after a storm has been cast and becoming air three mages and then spamming thunderstrike summon water power can be used by any water mage will increase their level in water magic by one but it can only be used underwater so it's fairly limited in that regard 
Summon Earth Power is one of the most powerful of the elemental powers, and that is because in addition to granting an Earth Magic bonus, it also gives a pretty good amount of reinvigoration. This means that the mage that casts this is going to have a significant boost to fatigue reduction every single turn. Not only is this going to make spell casting much more efficient, uh, if you have a communion master cast this, this is going to affect all of the communion slaves and it's going to make communions more efficient. And there's also a very common spell that people use with their thugs and super competence because it makes them less likely to fatigue out and get killed. Strength of Gaia is somewhat difficult for a lot of nature mages to cast because you require this cross path and you also require a fairly powerful nature mage at the same time. But it's also a very good power spell, because not only do you get the nature magic bonus, but you also get some pretty good buffs. That's Bark Skin Regeneration and Strength of Giants. So this is a really nice one, especially to get into communions. Uh, Light of the Northern Star is fairly powerful, requires an Astral 3 mage to cast. It's going to boost the Astral level of every single Astral mage on the battlefield, including your opponents. So be careful when you make use of this spell because you might be making your opponent more powerful. Now this is a very good spell to use in certain communion builds, it's going to make your communions much more efficient, but it is best used against opponents that are not using Astral mages or against opponents where maybe they are using astral mages but you know you're just going to dab on them anyway after you cast this and power of the spheres is really cool any astral mage can cast this spell and it's going to boost every single magic path that that mage has by one once again this is a very good thing for communion masters to cast because it's going to make your communions a lot more efficient now hell power this one is pretty interesting to say the least. You don't see this one cast anywhere near as often as the rest of these, and that's because when you cast it, you're, the mage that casts it gets horror marked. Now this is a really powerful spell. You get a magic boost two to all of that mage's paths, and then a ton of buffs on top of that. Unfortunately, the horror mark is permanent, and the moment that you cast this spell, Horrors are going to start popping up on the battlefield attacking this mage. Horrors, if you don't know what they are, are really, really nasty. And when they are attacking things, they tend to horror mark what they are attacking, which can result in more horrors coming to the battlefield. And if you have horrors show up and start horror marking things, it can snowball into an army wipe presuming you don't have anything that can handle the horrors somewhat efficiently. Now this does have some interesting implications. You can attempt to use this to nuke the battlefield. For example, have a small army of blood mages in a sabbath, cast this a few times, get some horrors onto the battlefield, get your opponent's stuff horror marked, and either do significant damage to your opponent's army that way, or at least get some of their important commanders and mages horror marked and make them really difficult to use. So in my mind, this is actually more of an offensive spell than a magic booster. It's just technically, yeah, you can use this to boost your pass in magic, and pretty significantly to that end. There are certain super competent builds that don't care about horrors as much that will cast this at the beginning of a battle. And divine channeling is something that extremely unusually powerful priests can cast. Now do keep in mind that if a priest enters a communion as a communion master, it will also get its holy skill boosted as well as its other magic paths. So that is one way to cast this spell if you would like to. Other ways to cast this are fairly difficult. Some of the most common of which, and these are not common at all by the way, would be getting an H3 priest, prophetizing it so that it's H4, and then building a unique holy booster. So you would need access to H3 priests as well as construction eight to reach it in that way. Another way is some nations do have H4 heroes. If you prophetize them, they will become H5. And what this is going to do is it's going to increase the priest level on all of your priests by one. Now the applications of this are somewhat limited. Where I would imagine this being useful is if you have a bunch of H1 priests and you want to turn them into a demon smiting army or a sacred stunning army. And the other one would be if you have a bunch of H2 priests and you want to turn them into a sort of bootleg evocation army by having them spam the H3 priest spells. Also, banishment and demon smiting spells become more powerful when the priest that's casting it is more powerful. So if you have a bunch of H2 priests 
casting banishment against undead, it's going to do a lot more damage than a bunch of H1 priests doing it. So communions are a very good way to boost magic paths inside of combat. Communions are a little bit complicated and they're not enormously beginner friendly. But the basics of how a communion works is that you have one or more mages cast communion master and ideally two or more mages cast communion slave. The mages that cast communion slave will not be able to cast spells. The communion master is going to get a boost in all of its magic paths depending on the amount of communion slaves you have in your army. And also the communion slaves are going to take the communion master's non-encumbrance fatigue from spell casting. So the communion master can sit there and dish out spells non-stop so long as the communion slaves are alive and functioning. Also any buffs that communion masters get are going to also hit the communion slaves. This is a really important consideration when you are attempting to make the communion slaves more efficient. If you have two communion slaves it'll boost all of the masters paths by one. If you have four communion slaves it'll boost it by two. If you have eight it'll boost them by three. Sixteen, four, thirty-two, five, and 64, 6, but you're getting kind of ridiculous at that point. Other ways to get mages into communions are in blood with sabbaths. These will enter the same communions that astral mages are entering. So say if you have a bunch of communion slaves and you have masters casting sabbath masters, uh, these communion slaves will act as slaves for the sabbath masters. It, it all interacts interchangeably. And the same goes for crystal matrices and slave matrices. This is a way that you can get mages that don't have any astral or blood into communions. These are items that you can forge and give to a mage, and then that mage will be able to enter communions, either as a master or as a slave. If you are casting Sabbath spells, make sure to remember Reinvigoration, that removes an enormous amount of fatigue from the blood mage that cast it, which is really important when you're casting High Fatigue Sabbath Master or Sabbath Slave. Uh, communions are a very complicated subject that really an entire video could be spent discussing. Getting your communions to be efficient can require a lot of finesse, as when your slaves build up enough fatigue, they will start taking fatigue damage and they can die. These two spells right here can be used to permanently boost your magic paths to a limited extent. Triceborn is something that death mages that are at least death 2 can cast. When that mage dies, it's going to reappear in the province that you cast Triceborn in as an undead mage. And I believe it is about a 10% chance for it to actually increase in its death path as it does this. So you do this with a death 2 mage, there's about a 10% chance for it to come back as a death 3 mage. You're probably going to be more interested in doing this with mage that are at least death 3 or 4 because getting up to death 4 or death 5 can be important milestones in death magic and a lot of times you're casting the spell anyway it's not as much that you're using it to try and boost up into death though you know you might find yourself in that situation it's mostly that you're using it to either protect your mages or just remove the upkeep on them because white mages don't cost upkeep uh, transformation is a really cool spell uh, look up the statistics that Wonko has put together for this if you want some more information on it. According to what he's gathered at least, you're going to have about a 1 in 4 to 1 in 5 chance of boosting in a path of magic on the mage that casts this. However, the path that you're getting boosted is not reliable, and there's also a chance that the mage might die or turn into a feeble-minded foul spawn based off of your luck and misfortune scales. At high luck, this is a spell that you might consider casting. I actually consider it a very good spell to cast if you have high upkeep nature mages. And that's because most of the time this is going to remove the upkeep on those mages. And the actual chance for them dying is at least at luck 3. I usually don't use this spell unless I'm on a luck 3 scales build. It's really not common that mages die from using this. In Wonko statistics, you're looking at like 1%. However, something close to 10% of them run the risk of being feeble-minded. I think that's worth it when you need to remove upkeep as you're gonna, it's gonna save you gold overall. It is possible to cure feeble mind, however, for some nations much easier than others. Now, another way to break into paths of magic is to take your opponent's mages from them. Say, for example, if you are M.A. Marignon and you have true 
troubadours, and your opponent has female mages in paths that you don't have, which is fairly likely since you are Maring Yon, you could consider trying to woo the mages with this troubadour and convert them to your side. Anything that has the seduction ability is capable of this. Just keep in mind that males will only be able to affect female mages, and females will only be able to affect male mages. When a seduction attempt goes haywire, it will become an assassination attempt, so there will be a fight, which makes troubadours not the best at seduction, and dryads very good at seduction, because then they can just cast something like Swarm. Something else you can do is pay attention to the heroes that are in the game. If any heroes happen to be mages in paths that you don't have, and they have died, you can cast Ritual of Rebirth and revive that hero as a mummy, and it will have those paths. Charm and Enslaved Mind are a little bit more brute force methods to gain control of your opponent's mages. It's a little bit difficult to get a hold of mages you're looking for in specific paths in the middle of a battle with these spells, but if your opponent is raiding you with a, say, thug that's in a path that you don't have, and it doesn't have ridiculously high magic resistance, you might consider trying to hit it with Charm and Enslaved Mind. Both have advantages. For example, with Charm, if you gain control of an enemy commander with this, it's not going to to lose its sentience and just become a unit the way that Enslaved Mind does. The moment you get that mage, you will be able to use that mage. Whereas if you get a hold of a mage with Enslaved Mind, you'll have to cast either Divine Name or a Gift of Reason to turn it back into a commander to be able to use it. However, Enslaved Mind has a much higher range, a lower fatigue cost, so it's easier to spam, and it comes in Astral, so a mage that's able to cast this is also able to cast Teleport, so they can actually intercept a thug, and then spam and slave mind on it. So these are ways that you can potentially break into other paths of magic. What Divine Name and Gift of Reason do is take a unit and turn it into a commander. Gift of Reason will not work on mindless units, but Divine Name will. Not only can this be used to take mages you've acquired with Enslave Mind and make them functional, but there are some units in the game that if you cast Divine Name or Gift of Reason on them, they actually have magic paths built into them. The Care is an example of this that a lot of Greek themed nations can summon. So for example, if you were EA Arcoscephalae and you were to summon some cares, maybe you broke into death two through trolls with your nature mages, you can then cast Gift of Reason on one of those cares and it will become a death one, blood one mage. So this is a way that EA Arcoscephalae can break into blood built into their nation, albeit a little bit complicated and expensive. So before talking about any other diversity summons or boosting summons, I want to talk about Tartarians. And that's because Tartarians can literally get you into every single path of magic. Now this isn't something that you'll be using very commonly, because for one thing, this spell comes in at Conjuration 9. That is extremely late game. Generally, the only time to see Tartarians is if a game goes on really long and people just manage to force themselves into high paths of death because at that point they will need things like this to stay competitive. Or if someone has specifically designed their Pretender, Bless, and Slash, or Scales, to get into Tartarians as soon as possible. Which isn't that soon, but if someone builds with these in mind, you will occasionally see them sooner than you would expect. They're also fairly restricted in needing a Death 7 Mage to be able to cast them. Then when they come in, they are not commanders, they're not mages. You're going to have to cast Gift of Reason or Divine Name on these to turn them into mages. And on top of that, they're almost certainly going to have affliction, sometimes a lot of afflictions, oftentimes feeble-minded. So unless you're willing to have a good portion of your Tartarians come in not very useful or just completely useless, you're going to have to come up with some way to cure their afflictions. Now some nations have access to commanders that can heal. That's great. There is of course the global enchantment gift of health, but it's there's some competition for this. Most nations want this. And something that's fairly common that people do when they're specifically building with tarts in mind is to take a Recuperation Bless on their Pretender and then hand them Shrouds of the Battle Saint, which will make them sacred, and then their afflictions will heal. Uh, Feeble-minded takes a bit of time to heal, though, I find. But I wanted to talk about these right away because I didn't want to have to mention them every single time I'm talking about a School of Magic because these have all of them. Obviously, if you're looking to get into Earth, they are a little more reliable in that regard, but for the most part, you are rolling the dice quite a bit. So there isn't an enormous amount going on with fire, at least when it comes to just 
peer diversity in accessing fire. You've really only got a couple that are commonly accessible and one of them isn't very reliable at all. And most nations that will be able to summon flame spirits will have at least base fire 3. And I'll talk a little bit about what's going on here. So your flame spirits, where I could see this actually coming into being a boost for you, is to say you only have access to F2, but you have the death fire cross path and can build schools of fire. If you put a scroll of fire on your F2 mage, have him summon a flame spirit, hand the scroll of fire to the flame spirit, it can now make flame helmets. So it is a way to kind of wiggle up from F2 to F5 if you've got the death fire cross bat. Now, dust priests, which come from an extremely expensive spell in the earth death cross path, about half of them are going to be at least F1, and a third of them are going to random two paths of fire magic. It's possible you get an F3 out of this. However, I've done some testing on this. It says you'll get more of these priests in high magic, high luck scales. Just a heads up, I wouldn't expect getting more than one, even with luck three, magic three scales. It's not very reliable. I've gotten I've gotten two. The way the spells are written is it seems like, oh man, I might be able to get like three or four of these with good scales. Uh, no, uh, not in my experience. You're probably going to get one. You might get two. But I haven't done like extensive testing with this. It would be interesting to see more detailed stats on this spell and other things like Hidden Underneath and Hidden in Snow. Bind Arc Devil is reasonably accessible for lots of blood nations with the Blood and Fire Cross Bath at Blood 7. These are all unique, which means there can only be one of each in the game. Four of these are going to be F4 mages, which can definitely be a boost for you if you're looking to climb fire. One of them is F3 Astral 3, and that's not really something you can complain about. And you've got two Elemental Kings at Conjuration 8, both of the kings of elemental fire are F5. And you know, why you need an F5 mage to cast this is like you may have boosted to this. You may have had an F4 mage wearing a flame helmet. Now you have an F5 mage. Give one of these a flame helmet and they are F6. And the same kind of goes for King of Bane Fires. You may have crawled up to this using Skulls of Fire and whatnot, and now he is a native F4. At Blood 8, you've got the Heliophagi. Only one of these is F4, and these are all unique, just like the Arc Devils. And what are also unique are the Demon Lords. These are extremely late in the game, Blood 9, but several of these are pretty high in fire. So I'm just mentioning them to that end. Uh, the Magic Lamp, this is a unique item. At level 8 construction, once again, you know, super late. But what happens is, is that this basically summons the Jin, And the Jin is F5. Now the Jin is also unique, and so is his lamp. If uh, if you summon the Jin and then someone builds another lamp, uh, Genie's gone. And now they have the lamp, so something to keep in mind. Air magic, just as it's kind of hard to boost, is also kind of hard to break into and climb up into. The most common way that people do it by far is the Fairy Queen, and this is a Conjuration 8 Nature 5 spell, so you already need a fairly powerful Nature Mage to cast this in the first place, but it will net you an Air 3 Mage. Now, unfortunately, it's a little bit difficult to climb further with just an Air 3, but that's just the reality. Air is kind of hard to climb. If you happen to be a nation that has native Air 4 mages, it's not very difficult to cast Queen of Elemental Air. Uh, just like other Elemental Royalty, these are all unique. There can only be one of each in the game, and all of these are Air 5. They're fairly similar to each other. By the way, these things have absolutely ridiculous flying map move. Also, with Air, you do have the Genie, and I've already kind of discussed what's going on there with Fire, though this one does have the high Air requirement to it, so you're not weaseling up quite as much as you are with Fire. And then this is another one of the Demon Lords, at Blood 9. Unfortunately, this one cannot wear a winged helmet. Also, I forgot to mention with air, the Aether Lord can potentially random one air, but this is a very expensive way to break into a very insignificant amount of air. So water's got a decent amount of stuff going on. Uh, one of the most common is going to be the Naiad, and the reason why this one's done so commonly isn't just because of water, but also the, its nature boosting potential. So it's not as big of a deal as far as climbing water goes, where this becomes useful for climbing water is say you have a water two mage, you can forge a water bracelet for it, summon a Naiad, and then the Naiad will be able to wear multiple boosters. Uh, these are homesick by the way, so they don't travel very far without dying. And you might want to be doing this from water two say if you're in some kind of game where you're you know up at conjuration eight or some shit and you're wanting to get some 
elemental water queens. Getting from water 2 to water 5 is going to require something like a naiad or a sea king, which is just a straight water 3 mage that comes with a retinue of trolls. Uh, all this stuff costs upkeep, keep that in mind. It's not too common that summoned mages and units cost upkeep. Trolls, however, do. So specters are fairly interesting. They require a death 3 to be able to cast them, and they have a fairly useful spread of randoms. Not only are you able to get water 1 mages, occasionally you will net a water 2 from these. But usually what people are looking for with these are astral and earth, and potentially the cross path for crystal gear. So kokithiads are usually used to climb death and not water, but you could potentially climb water with these. Say you only have water 2, you use that water 2 to build a water bracelet, then make a robe of the sea with it, now you have a base water 2 that becomes water 4. Of course it would have to have the death cross path as well, and then you can summon Kokithiads and you now have a base water 3. Lamia Queens are one of my favorite mage summons at Conjuration 6. Uh, they require a fairly sophisticated mage to cast them, but they're not very expensive for what they are. And they're always going to be death 2 and n1, and then they have two randoms including the potential to break into water. Now usually with these I'm focusing on climbing death or getting into blood, but I have appreciated them for their water potential, for example when playing Marignon and taking a pretender that can summon these. Chiefly the water nature and water blood cross paths can be very useful. Um, Unfrozen Mage, this one, I mean, I would be really surprised if someone ever intentionally and successfully used this at some point to climb water. I'm just mentioning it because you technically could. Like, to cast this, you're already going to need a Water 3 Mage in the first place with a Death Cross Path. It is not very likely that one of these is actually going to be Water 3. And it's kind of like hidden in sand, probably not going to get more than one of these. And it costs 75 Water Gems to cast this, so it's like you're probably already going to be somewhat familiar with water. And yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to stop talking about it. I'm just mentioning it because... You know, it's technically possible that you could climb water with it. So, Bind Ice Devil, this is one of my favorite blood spells, largely because it only comes in at blood 6. This comes in fairly early for one of the major unique blood summons. And all of these, except one of them, are going to be water 3. This one is water 2, but he's still a very powerful raider. And then you've got Elemental Royalty in water. There are three varieties. They are all fairly similar to each other and are a good way to secure high water if you are among the first to cast this spell. Now when it comes to earth, probably the most common thing by far that people summon with a focus on the earth path is the troll king. Largely where this comes up is when people have earth 2 mages, they'll have the earth 2 mages build some earth boots, put them on, and then summon a troll king who can then wear earth boots to be earth 4. Now just like other trolls, this thing comes with a retinue and all this costs upkeep. But this guy right here is your basic unit of getting up into earth. Uh, spectral mages also, I've used these myself to get into the earth path. They are not very reliable at all for getting into earth 2. Now I'm not very good at understanding maths. Maybe someone who's better at it post in the comments exactly how many of these are going to be earth and earth 2. I usually have to draw out stupid charts to understand this stuff, but I believe about somewhere around a third of these are going to at least have one earth. And it's a little more easy to understand with the troll shaman where I think definitely about a third of these are going to have one earth. But that's all you're getting. It's just a way that you can maybe get a little splash of earth if all you have is nature 3. What's a little more ridiculous than using a troll shaman to splash into earth is using a tree lord to splash into earth. This is getting pretty desperate here. This thing can't even move so you can't really sight search with earth. I'm just, you know, it's there. I gotta mention it. And mentioning the Jin again, uh, this is actually a pure break into earth with this because you don't require any earth to forge the item and he's going to be an earth 3 mage. Uh, Alright, we got these assholes again, the hidden underneath, hidden in sand, hidden in snow. While the hidden in snow is actually at this point a somewhat reasonable way to break into something, uh, you probably will not be using hidden underneath or hidden in sand to break into earth and that's because they require earth 3 to cast and then you are not very likely 
to get an Earth 3 Mage from them. Now I will say, at least when it comes to Hidden Underneath, it does come with very good units. The other two have some pretty interesting units, but Hidden Underneath actually does have a solid retinue with it, so it at least has that going for it. And also it is the most reliable out of these two to get the Earth Astral Cross Path. So there are two Earth Elemental Kings. Uh, it's kind of unfortunate these things cannot wear Earth Boots, so it's a little bit harder to climb with them past this, which is unfortunate because oftentimes Earth 6 is what people are looking for, you know, like Earth Blood Deep Well. So you need something like an Elemental Staff or a Bloodstone. And then there's Father Ill Earth. Uh, I don't think you'd really be climbing anything with this because it can't wear boots. I mean, you know, if you have the base Earth, Earth 3 to cast this, you do have the cross path to build Bloodstones. That means, you know, you could just pass a Bloodstone and boots to a Troll King and it'll be Earth 5. So there might be some niche way to climb up higher into earth with this that I'm not thinking of. Maybe using some artifacts or something, but for the most part I think anything that this can equip, a uh, troll king can match it just by being able to wear shoes. Uh, Ruex, king of magma, pretty desperate way to get into earth, but you know it technically is one of the two fire elemental royalty and it does have one path in earth, so might as well mention it. And then one of the demon lords is earth 4. Uh, also, he cannot wear shoes, but he doesn't require any earth at all to summon so it is a pure break into earth also with earth i mean technically a worm mage has a 20 percent chance of getting one earth but by thaumaturgy 8 i'm sure you figured something out by now so here's what's going on in Astral. Uh, by far the most common way that people break into Astral through summons is with Spectral Mages at D3. If my maths are even remotely correct, about a third of these are going to have at least one Astral, and occasionally you'll pick up an Astral too, though very rarely. But it is a way to at least get a Sight Searcher going for Astral to maybe generate some pearls. Uh, Ethergate is really expensive at Conjuration 6, and it has a somewhat restrictive cross path, but this thing could end up being crucial for climbing up high into Astral, and that's because one in four of these are going to be Astral 4. Astral 4 is really important because, say, if you can make Starshine Skull Caps and Crystal Coins, you can put them on an Astral 4 Aether Lord, and then it will be Astral 6. With that, you can build a Ring of Sorcery, equip it to the Aether Lord, and it's now Astral 7. So this is potentially, though not an entirely reliable and very expensive way to climb up into high Astral from about moderate Astral. Say if you have like two Astral, one Death Mage, Crystal Coin, Starshine Skull Cap, and then you can cast this. Uh, Golems, I would imagine, are fairly rare to actually be used to climb Astral, and that's because you will almost certainly already have Astral 2 Mages to be able to summon a Golem. There are some niche ways where I can imagine you actually using this to climb. Say maybe you only had Astral 1 and like Earth 2 and you traded for Astral items, like yeah, maybe. But generally this isn't going to be used to climb, I'm just mentioning it because it's technically possible. Uh, the Jin again, this is the last time I'll be mentioning him, and that's because he is a pure break into Astral 3, though it's not going to happen very often because this is a level 8 construction unique item. Uh, these guys are back again. The Dust Priest is not very reliable to get into Astral, only about 1 in 3 of them are. I mean, do keep in mind that if you have positive luck and magic scales, it supposedly is fairly likely you might at least get two of these. In my experience with like Luck 3, Magic 3, I think maybe it's like 50% of the time you'll get to. Maybe. I, I haven't done enough testing with big numbers to be sure of that. But it's technically a way to get Astral 2 with also the Earth Cross Path secured. So that is at least something that has going for it. I think if you are looking for the Astral Earth Cross Path, this is much more reliable because almost all of them are going to be at least Astral 1. And occasionally you get one that is Astral 2. And it's also, even though you know you have to cast this in a cave, you at least get a good solid retinue with it. Which, you know, when you're spending 75 Earth Gems, you know, it's at least try to get what you can get. I would say most of the time the Release Sage is going to be the better option if both of these are available to you. It is a little easier to find wastelands than caves in most maps. Uh, Arc Devil is a potential way to break into Astral purely from Blood and Fire. He is unique, there can only be one of them, however, most of the time you cast Bind Arc Devil, you're going to get one of the Fire 4 mages. And similarly with the Ice Devil, there are six of these, but it is a straight break into Astral. You can get to this without having any Astral whatsoever, 
then of course it can build a starshine skull cap and become astral three but five out of six of these have no astral and then there's also one demon lord that does have three astral requires no astral whatsoever to summon and he can wear a starshine skull cap now as you can see there's quite a bit going on with death uh the revenant is actually probably the only thing i've mentioned in this video that literally cannot help you climb at all i'm just mentioning it because i've already mentioned like everything else that can be summoned that has a path and magic and i guess really the only thing that you'd probably use this for is maybe science searching uh spectral mages are a fairly common summon though usually not for climbing death because you need death three to be able to cast this in the first place and it is very unlikely you will get a death three mage out of it that could be potentially help you climb, you may have cast this with a death 2 mage with a skull staff and it may be your most powerful death mage. Then you could pass your skull staff off to him and you're at death 4. But there are other ways way down the line to get a death 3 mage out of death 3. Uh, Troll Shaman is actually probably one of the best mages for breaking into death and that's because you only need nature 3 to be able to cast this and it can random death 2 which then can build a skull staff and become death 3 that looks like it already has something like this because the bootleg skull staff. So absolutely excellent way for breaking into death when you don't have any whatsoever. Uh, Lamia Queens at Conjuration 6, they require a fairly powerful mage to be able to cast this, but if base 2 death is all you've got, there's a good chance that these will be at least base death 3. Now the death 4 random is not very reliable, but it is technically possible. And Kokithiads are actually a very good way to start climbing death if all you have is this cross path and very low death in it. This is going to boost you straight from death 1 all the way to death 3, that's great. Uh, Therados is an example of a nation where this can be a fairly relevant mage. And then Mound Fiends are actually pretty good if all you have are base death 2 mages because that's all you need to cast them. Just have them build a skull staff and then you have a base death three mage. Comes after a decent amount of time at Conjuration seven, but it's probably your best option when it comes to just a straight death three. So this is the last time I'll be mentioning the three stooges over here. While they've been varying in value as I've been mentioning them so far, uh, one thing they actually can do with certainty is bring you from one death to two death. So, you know, that's something. This one can technically get three. And this also hit an in sand with certainty one death to two death and also once again potentially three however you do not have that certainty with hidden and snow most of the time you will get a death two mage out of this but it's not secure the way it is with the other two spells likewise ether lords are a way to go from one death to two death and potentially three and it costs you know about the same as hidden underneath and hidden in sand at least though you're getting a fairly powerful astral mage out of the deal with the potential for also hitting astral four wraith lords probably will not be be used to be climbing death because you need to have death five to cast them in the first place you have you know mound fiend as well the only reason you'd get the wraith lord over this is if you also wanted the cool immortal chassis now briefly mentioning the worm that walks Technically, about one in five of them will be death. That's stupid, though. I mean, if you're at Thaumaturgy 8 and you're not at Conjuration 6, I don't know what you're doing. Just summon a troll shaman. Freak. Uh, the Lich is fairly useful when you're somewhat secured in high astral, so you can build rings that will boost your death. And it can be a way to climb a little bit higher into death, but it does require the death five, similarly to the Wraith Lord. It's basically just a more useful version of the Wraith Lord when it comes to climbing. However, it does come out enchantment eight, so it's not as accessible. So half of the unique Heliophagi have death. Uh, one of them is death 3 and the other is death 4. That is fairly powerful, especially considering all you need to be able to cast these is blood 5. You don't need any death whatsoever and suddenly you have a fairly powerful death mage. And the same goes for there is a single ice devil out of the 6 that has death 3 as well as water 3. So vampire lords will not often be used to climb death because it requires a death 4 to be able to do so. The situation here would be kind of similar to what I'm talking about where you have access to rings and maybe only a death two. So like a death two with a skull staff and a ring of sorcery that also has blood could cast vampire lord and then the vampire lord will be the most powerful death mage that you have. But usually people aren't summoning these to climb death. They're summoning them because they are powerful immortal raiders. You have the King of Bane Fires, however, this is nothing new. If you can, if you have Death 3 and are getting a Death 3, you can just summon a Mound Fiend. But, I mean, obviously the chassis is a lot 
better than a Mountain Fiend if you have to choose between the two. And then at Blood Nine, there are several Demon Lords with death. Unfortunately, two of them can't hold Skull Staffs and the other one can't wear a Skull Face. However, this does have my favorite of the Demon Lords and that is the Muffuggin Goat Sun. Now I'm going to briefly mention the Pocket Lynch because you're technically boosting kind of in a weird way, though it's not really useful in that regard. It's a unique artifact item that comes in at level 8 construction, and you have to have a Death 4 Mage make it. Now what it is, it's not like a commander that you can have cast rituals and equip stuff to and script, unfortunately, and that's why I say it's not really much of a way to boost it. It's just a very tech, like technically, you know, you're, you can get a higher Death Mage out of this. Just technically. But he's basically, at the beginning of the battle, whoever's holding this, the Pocket Lich is going to pop up next to them and cast spells. So you can't script him, can't really do much with him. But I do wonder if you could steal him with Enslaved Mind or Charm. That would be kind of interesting. Now, I will say right away that when it comes to nature, only one of these is really useful in most scenarios for climbing nature, and in that regard it's very useful, and that's the Naiad. So if you get the Water Nature Cross Path and worm up to Water 3 with it, that's going to secure you access to Nature 3. Uh, yeast is an example off the top of my head of a nation that can climb up into Nature 3 this way without having access to anything more than Nature 1. So Naiads are super good in this regard, it's probably their most significant significant use. Uh, they are however homesick, which is a bummer, so they'll die if they spend too much time away from the province that they're summoned in. Uh, most of this other stuff over here isn't actually going to help you much when it comes to actually climbing nature, uh, other than of course demon lords if you manage to get up into blood nine. There are two demon lords that have for nature, so it's something to consider. And this one is actually able to hold stuff like thistle maces and whatnot. But I do suppose it's technically conceivable that with an Ivy King, you may have, say, a Nature 2 Mage with a Thistle Mace and a Ring of Sorcery. So it is it is potentially a way to climb up a little bit higher. So the problem when it comes to the concept of climbing with Awakened Tree Lords is that at Nature 5, you can make Tree Lord stabs. And these guys don't have arms. They have branches that look like arms, but they can't actually hold a Tree Lord staff. At best, they can hold a Moonvine bracelet. I mean, you could be plugging in copper arms and hand them Thistle Maces and stuff like that. So let's say even if you got up to Nature 5 with a Thistle Mace and a Moonvine bracelet, you make a Tree Lord staff, and then the guy is Nature 6. And then so you plug in a copper arm and then give him the Thistle Mace, he's now Nature 7. Even if you gave a copper arm to a dying Tree Lord, hand him a Moonvine bracelet and a Thistle Thistle Mace, he's also Nature 7. That's as high as you're going to get. Same goes for, you know, if you only have two miscellaneous slots, that's a problem. You know, just Ring of Sorcery, Moonvine Bracelet, that's really all you can get up to. So I don't really see a situation where these can actually help you climb. I might be overlooking something really basic. If I am, just let me know. Uh, Worm Mage, however, technically could get, help you climb up into nature. And that's because the thing is at least fully slotted and can at least potentially get nature form. So even though at this point, you'd already be able to summon just a straight up Ivy King or a Fairy Queen. Now this one does have a very small chance of getting Nature 4. I wouldn't rely on that. I wouldn't expect that. I'm just saying, you know, technically you could climb a little bit with this. Um, Fairy Court isn't bringing anything new to you that the Ivy King doesn't have other than a head slot, but that's not going to help you when it comes to boosting up into nature. Uh, Lamia Queen, I would be very surprised if anyone ever actually used this to climb up into higher nature. Here's the extremely specific situation where you use this to climb up into higher nature. You are not at Conjuration 7 yet, so you cannot summon an Ivy King. You do not have the Water Nature Cross Path, so you cannot summon a Naiad. You have a Thistle Mace, a Ring of Sorcery, and a Moonvine Bracelet on a Nature 2 Mage, and you cast Contact Lamia Queen and happen to get one that's Nature 3. Like, yeah, I don't think that's ever happened in a Dominions game. Maybe it has. That would be funny. Once again, I'm trying to be kind of thorough with this video, so I'm mentioning things that are technically possible. And also when it comes to the technically, uh, you may actually use a Troll Shaman to climb nature in the very niche case where you have nature one mage and access to rings of sorcery, but otherwise no nature. So, you know, you put a ring of sorcery on the nature one mage, nature two, build a thistle mace, nature three, summon Troll Shaman, and then you potentially have a nature two mage.
So when it comes to blood, the most relevant summon most of the time is probably going to be the Lamia Queen, and that is because it can break you from no blood into blood, and there aren't a whole lot of summons that can do that. And the thing is with blood magic, blood magic is the easiest school of magic to empower, uh, because you can mass tons and tons of blood mages and then just eat them to make your blood mages more powerful. Uh, second to that would, I guess, maybe technically be Astral, because you could turn gems that you're not using as much into astral pearls but blood is by far the easiest so it's not as pressing to try and climb up in really weird Rube Goldberg ways but you still might want to when it comes to just you know efficiency with your blood slaves but once again you know there's a lot of technicalities here like Technically, if the best blood mage you have is blood 2 with a death 4 cross path and use a ring of sorcery to cast vampire lord, you now have a more powerful blood mage. Technically, the same goes for Father Illerth. If you use a ring of sorcery to cast this, you now have a more powerful blood mage. This tree lord is one of the three unique tree lords. It's technically just another example of breaking into blood without blood. It's a really bad one. It's a really expensive way to get a hold of blood and then it can't move. So I guess if you're really desperate and you're actually going this route to get a hold of blood, uh, make sure you summon it in a province that you can blood hunt in because that's just about all it's going to do for you. Uh, all of the Heliophagi are at least blood 3. One of them is blood 4. This is actually a little more realistic when it comes to climbing blood because you say maybe have a blood three mage wearing an armor of souls and a ring of sorcery casting this and then the blood four heliophagi is going to be a straight upgrade further reach a blood two mage wearing an armor of souls ring of sorcery and ring of wizardry so while i think the situation's not that common it technically is possible and it's not as big a deal because it's not that hard to empower in blood anyway and all of the demon lords have at least four blood a couple of them have five I do, however, think that it is very unlikely that at Blood 9, for a Blood 8 ritual, that you will be using these to climb blood. And it's like, what do you want above 8 blood anyway? What are you trying to cast? Alright, anything down here, bud? Also, do keep in mind that there's one method for breaking into blood, and that is the scout method. So I went in and ran a pretty quick test game, and I had three scouts, each on a province that had at least 5,000 population. And all three of those scouts were blood hunting the entire time. On the left here is just how many blood slaves I got per turn from all of the scouts together. And it took me 16 turns to get enough blood slaves to empower. Now, of course, it could take longer than this. It could be shorter. Who knows? This is just simply one way that you can wriggle into blood blood if you need to. And I'm going to briefly mention the bishop fish because this is a way to get h3 if you already don't have access to that. All you need is water 3 and conjuration 6 and you'll be able to snag one of these. Uh, unfortunately you can only cast this underwater and the guy is aquatic. So if you want him to come onto land you're going to have to build either an amulet of the fish or a shambler skin armor. I will also briefly mention Prophetization because that is the easiest way to climb in your holy levels. If you are to Prophetize an H1 or an H2 priest or a non-priest, they are going to become H3. If you Prophetize an H3 priest, they are going to become H4, and if you Prophetize an H4 priest, though they're kind of rare, it will become an H5. Also something you want to check out with any nation that you're playing is lots of nations have unique mage summons that other nations don't get a hold of and you might be able to break into paths of magic specifically with those. And this is just an example using LA Raga. Usually with LA Raga you are at best going to get to Astral 3. And that's getting an Astral Random Area Seraph and putting a Starshine Skull Cap on. And lots of people when they play LA Raga they play with heat scales so it's going to be hard to get one of these in the first place. But there's a way to get to Astral 7 really easily with Raga. All you need is Construction 6, Conjuration 6, and a decent pile of Death and Astral Gems. You don't even need the uh, Area Seraph. All you need is a Turan Sorcerer that has randomed Death 2. And with that Death 2 random, you're going to build a Skull Stat. And then he will be Death 3, Fire 3, and that will allow him to call Yadas. The one you need specifically, there's four different kinds. They're not unique, so you'd have to roll this. But the one that you need specifically is the Deva of Shooting Stars. When you get this, you can have him forge a Starshine Skull Cap. He will now be Astral 4, and he can call Celestial Yazads, also at Conjuration 6. 
and there's quite a few of these. All are fairly useful, but the two you're looking for when it comes to Astral are the Yazad of Earth, who can forge a crystal coin, and pass that over to a Yazad of the Stars, who starts out as Astral 4. If this guy holds a crystal coin and a Starshine Skullcap, he can then forge a Ring of Sorcery, equip it, and he will be Astral 7. So this is just one example of using national summons to climb higher into a path of magic. There's a lot of different examples of this with different nations. So check out ahead of time what your nation can do and keep that in mind when you're building your pretender and whatnot. Here's that little bastard. I want, I want him as a commander if I can make it happen. I think that means I have him. He's not, yeah. Well. Mm. No negative lich. Ah, damn, it didn't work. 